Okay, well, we're now here with Mike Gascoigne, the Chief Technical Officer for Lotus. A uh, bit of a legend, if I may say so, on, in the panel. Mike, you've worked for, maybe it's quicker to say who you've not worked for over the years, but you've worked for pretty much everybody, including McLaren and, and Jordan and Renault and Toyota. Um, tell us about Lotus, why you're here, and what it means to be, to be working for this team. Uh, well, I mean, the idea to bring uh, Lotus back into Formula One sort of uh, started almost exactly a year ago. Um, we had uh, the entry procedure that the FIA put forward to get 13 teams into Formula One, and that was going to be three new teams. Um, there was the concept to, to have a, a team uh, with the Lotus name, and although we didn't get the initial entry, um, we kept working on it. And eventually, in September, when BMW Cyber pulled out, um, we got the entry. Now, for those who don't follow Formula One as, as much as we do, or indeed you do, uh, they may look at uh, oh, how Lotus done so far this season. Oh, they've, they've got no points. Oh, that's not going very, very well. Please explain why, why, in actual fact, it's been going pretty well so far this season. Yeah, I mean, we got our entry in September the 12th, as I said, and um, you know, the first race was five months away. And at that point, you know, we had a staff of, there are actually four of us on day one in, in, right. in, in an empty factory. And you're trying to compete on, on a world stage in a multi-million pound, pound industry. Um, you've got teams like McLaren, Ferrari spending budgets of maybe 250 million pounds, staff of, you know, 800. It's a little bit like, um, uh, you know, sort of saying to uh, um, Hingham Football Club, here you go, here's a million quid, I expect you to beat um, Chelsea next week. <laughs> uh, it's not going to happen. But that doesn't mean to say you can't invest in, in a club and build it up and, and eventually down the road it can be competitive. So we had a huge task on our hands. Um, but, um, you know, so we, 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 we didn't expect to be scoring points in our first year or challenging the established teams. What we wanted to do, the first target for us, there were three new teams on the grid, is to be the best of the new teams. And in fact, we, our entry was announced three months after theirs, so we were already on the back foot. But we firmly established ourselves as the best of the new teams. Um, we're now sort of qualifying within a second of uh, three or four of the established teams. And if by the end of the year, we can be racing in that midfield. Um, that's a good result for us. Um, if we are the best new teams, we'll finish 10th in the championship. That's worth a significant amount of prize money to us. So it's something that's very important. But also, we're here, we're racing, and uh, we're already starting on next year's car. Uh, we've now got 180 people here instead of four. Um, we've got uh, sort of nine months instead of five months to develop the car. So our resources are much better off. So we're doing our job as the best of the new teams, and we're getting ready to next year go and uh, really race in the midfield and score points. Now a couple more things before you go Mike, first of all uh, looking at your resume, uh, is it true that you were the coxswain at Churchill College Cambridge for the women's crew? It is, yeah, definitely true, um, I'm, as most people will be aware I'm not the tallest bloke in, in the world and um, I actually never had anything to do with rowing at, at Cambridge, uh, played cricket and rugby and and that, but uh, had a healthy disdain for the rowers. But I was accosted uh, one evening in the bar, somewhat worse for wear. Verbally no, accosted? No, I was accosted by two very tall, attractive females. Right. And I'd had a few drinks who, who asked me to go and steer their boat for them the next morning. <laughs> so um, drunkenly I said yes. And um, what you tend to find is most coxes tend to be only be picked because they're small and can't do anything else. And I'd done a lot of sailing, and, and, and obviously as a sportsman. Um, just they were a good group of girls and got into it and um, uh, I used to do all their training for them and I was actually the heaviest person in the boat most of the time but, um, but we ended up we were head of the river um, for several years uh, did lots of regrets with them won lots of things and uh, my first wife was actually bag in the boat so uh, married really? one of them as well so there you go fantastic that's a great story you 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 got a PhD in fluid Dynamism? Uh, no, there, there's your mistake. You That's see, an I urban studied, myth, is it? I studied for a PhD. I spent three uh, years at Cambridge. Oh, you did it see it through, did you? No, I spent three years at Cambridge, had a great time. Um, Sounds and, like it. And thought if uh, someone was going to pay me for another three years to stay there and have an equally great time, um, I sort of, there's no point rushing off to work for the rest of your life. 
So I did that, and as I was writing up and starting to look for a job, I read an old copy of Flight magazine. Uh, it was three months old, and in the back was an, an advert for a um, head of aerodynamics um, at McLaren. Um, so I thought, well, job's probably gone or whatever, but I wrote off. A uh, letter came back a day later. Um, and I thought, well, that must be, you know, thank you, filled the position. And it was no, come for an interview. So I rang them up. Next day I went for an interview and got a job. The rest, as they say. The rest is history, yeah. So, and uh, of course, uh, having started in motor racing, got fully immersed in it, that was that, and the PhD went west. But uh, um, it did serve its purpose because it got me the next rung on the ladder. So. Absolutely. Now, you're also into sailing, quite quite obviously, and it's quite interesting because that you can't think of two sort of polar extremes and the, the speed and the sound and the noise and the dirt of, of motor racing and the uh, relative serenity of sailing. Now, we do quite a lot of sailing. We, we know the Alex Thompsons of the world and the De Cafaris and, and all that crew very well, Ben Ainsley's. I mean, are they sort of heroes of yours as well, in a sense? Yeah, very much so. I mean, actually, I when I was at university, uh, um, I used to do a lot of mountaineering. I led a couple of expeditions in the Himalayas, so I'd always been into sort of, um, you know, adventure sports. I taught myself to paraglide, threw myself off mountains. And I grew up sailing on the Norfolk Broads. My dad ran Norfolk School Sailing Association, taught kids to sail. Um, so sailing was something always that I wanted to do. Um, you say it's sort of serene. I think we, uh, me and my partner Sylvie sail back from Monaco uh, to Barcelona. We keep the boat in Barcelona and we sail over to Monaco for the Grand Prix. I think we had a full eight Mistral for 36 hours sailing back. Uh, right. I don't think Sylvie was very seasick at the time, thought sailing was a particularly serene <laughs> no. occupation. At Were you loving time. it? Yeah, I had a great time. Yeah, yeah. really enjoy it. And uh, I've done some uh, solo sailing. Um, longest trip I've done is three days solo. Um, and uh, actually met Alex Thompson on Hugo Boss down in Monaco. We were, we were moored next to them. Um, and I was going to buy a, a Class 40 um, single-handed uh, offshore racing boat. Um, so still looking to do um, some, some solo offshore racing uh, in the future. But I've just signed a five-year contract here, so I've got a little bit on at the moment. Got a bit on at the moment. And you just told me something which I didn't know, and it's an area that we're all fascinated in, which is mountaineering. And particularly, you mentioned the Himalayas. Just, just talk us a little bit of, about that. You actually led some expeditions oh, to yes. Himalayan mountains. Yeah, it was in my youth, as you can obviously tell. Haven't done no, that No, not at all. While. Not at all, Mike. <laughs> but, um, no, I, I used to climb a lot when I was at university. Um, did seven or eight seasons in the Alps. Um, went on for two expeditions, was organising expeditions in sort of 87, 88. Um, and really, again, I got the first job at 89, so that's obviously when that stopped. But was still doing a lot of paragliding, so, um, you know, uh, it was great fun. Um, very committing in that. Um, the highest I got up to was 23,500 feet. It's pretty high. Was, yeah, successfully climbed a mountain, four of us. So, um, yeah, it was great fun in those days, but um, I'm a bit too old for it now, which is why the sailing is probably the, the route. But Sylvie, my partner, and I, Sylvie's head of marketing here, um, uh, you know, we're going to take three years off when we've finished and sail around the world. Fantastic. Um, so uh, that's very much a plan of ours. And that sounds so, brilliant. Uh, um, yeah, there's, I think, you know, this is a very exciting and committing um, sport and it's great to be in it because I loved competitive sport and I loved engineering and aerodynamics. So I ended up being given the dream job and the, the dream career. Um, but there's plenty more other things to do in the world and uh, there's plenty more places to see and Sylvie and I are going to get on the boat and go and see them. And if we come back, Mike, in, uh, in five years' time, and obviously you'll be pouring over your various charts uh, to see which direction you're going to take uh, to sail around the world, but it's not beyond the realms of possibility, is it, that uh, you may be answering this question, well, we're going to win the world title this year. Well, that's the aim, um, and uh, the boss wouldn't be paying me if I didn't think that was possible. Uh, it's a big ask, but you know we're Lotus. That's what we've got to get on and do, and uh, that's why we're here. And uh, I think Formula One is changing for the good, with the sort of uh, uh, cutting of budgets. The last ten years in Formula One have just been about a spending competition, um, you know, and only four or five teams could spend enough and win. Hopefully, that's changing, and you can be lean and efficient and competitive as a small team. And. Uh, that's why it's a great time to have the Lotus name back in Formula One because that was all about innovation and efficiency. And if we are, yeah, maybe we can uh, rub a few people's noses in it.